My paper is also a heuristic. It is about spatial uncertainty. And I would like you to think as I give you my paper about a fundamental question which I'm trying to get at, but which I haven't solved. And that's, that question is a question like Paul's, is what is the nature of prehistoric space and what is the nature of modern space and how people conceive of it? And my the real question I want to ask is, does spatial uncertainty increase or decrease over time? Okay. When we go to a new city like Bern, and, you know, this is where Einstein put together time and space. I mean, at the Einstein house, actually. You know, for many of us who've never been here before, we get lost very easily. But we pull out our telephones or our maps and we use the GIS systems and we find our way around. Well, we're uncertain. And is that degree of uncertainty any more or less than the degree of uncertainty that somebody prehistorically who knew their territory, but only to a certain extent, had? And so that's the fundamental first question I'm kind of interested in. The second question I am interested in is how archaeologists deal with their own spatial uncertainty. And my paper is a bit confusing because it combines the two, okay? So spatial uncertainty, as Robert Frost, you all, many of you may remember the poet, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And, you know, he says, I don't know what I'm going to do, but then he decides, I will, he's, I'm uncertain. I'll take the one less taken. And that has made all the difference. That's a, you know, kind of, and it is a degree of uncertainty of the way people behave. So spatial uncertainty, a prehistoric component, and then an archaeological component. And why is this an issue? Well, it's a basic issue because of all the things that Paul said, and because we're actually trying to look for some kinds of truth in terms of archaeological disciplines. We're trying to understand the past. We're trying to create heritage. Where we, we also have all kinds of modern issues about space and the past with regards to litigation and you know <coughs> jurisdiction and all that kind of thing, right? What is uncertainty? Well, uncertainty is our imperfect and inexact knowledge of the world. And then we use with, it with regards to our data because we are not exactly sure of what we observe or measure in either society or in nature. And Paul gave us some really nice examples of that, if you think about, you know, our uncertainty. What's behind us? You know, we only have so far a distance we can perceive, right? And so when we do the deal with that, we are, and if we recognize our uncertainty, then we have to be unsure of the conclusions which we reach out of those spatial analyses. So both prehistoric societies and archaeologists will cope with large amounts of spatial and also temporal uncertainty. And then I define it for the purposes as being the difference between the phenomena as cultural representation, as well as the lack and the error in position. So what are some of the sources of spatial uncertainty, both prehistorically and for modern people? One, we have errors in geographic location, right? We think we're someplace or someplace else, we think that place is somewhere, it's slightly somewhere off. We have partial and incomplete knowledge. We only know where half of the city is. We have inappropriate assumptions regarding the environment. For example, driving in the burn, I was supposed to go to the casino plots. And I got to the, I almost got to the casino plots. I couldn't get there incomplete knowledge of the environment. The police were blocking all the roads to the casino plots because Netanyahu was in town on Saturday. 
Right? So I'm driving around and around and out of the town and in the town. Right? Problems in classification. When we talk about a town or we talk about something else, is it the same thing? Um, lack of pattern recognition. And actually, even the probability that something exists, the probability that it has a location. Right? And we can classify spatial uncertainty. And this is a whole system for doing so. I'm not going to cover it and just let you know that it exists. And when I write this paper up <laughs> in more detail, you, there, there will be a big discussion of it. Let's take a quick look at, <laughs> excuse me, at one example of my own work on spatial uncertainty at the level of the archaeologist. Okay? This is probably relevant for many departments of antiquities um, uh, in many countries. I know it's true for the, the United States. I, there was something called the New York State Archaeological Survey. It has something like not 85,000 historic and archaeological sites. They've been calculating, keeping track of these sites for 40, 50, 50 years at least, right? And, you know, it's like any other department of antiquities. So I decided I'd go back and see if I could find the sites that they actually had. 50% were not where they were located. Right? There were errors in location recording. There were errors that people said the sites were there, but they were destroyed. There was errors in classification. They said it was a hunting and gathering site. It turned out to be, you know, something, an agricultural site, something like that. Well, one of the reasons is there was no quality control for negative findings, right? So nobody went out. If somebody said there's no sites there, nobody went out and rechecked, for example. And today, of course, GPS would probably fix many of the problems. But you know something? Nobody's going back and rechecking. <laughs> uh, there's errors in geographic location. They may be caused by psychological factors. So, inconsistencies in spatial perception. Errors may be caused because of mapping, um, both now and prehistorically. So, what do you do with boundaries, for example? That's what this little diagram shows about. Right? And errors in location may be caused by how spatial information is communicated, classified, stored, and transmitted over time and space, prehistorically, by word of mouth. You're going to go hunting, go down to four trees down, turn left at the stream, go over the stream, you know, at a given distance. Well, maybe it wasn't. It's changed. By natural language, is it what we mean the same thing when we say tree? Physical representations. Do we build little models of this? Well, and we have little models of prehistoric maps, actually. Um, a guy named uh, Patrick Daly and I wrote a paper on prehistoric maps and hunting and gathering maps and how different they were from ours and markers and how things are classified. And, you know, when you just think about it, here are some of today's ways of looking at marking space. And you can see uncertainty. Trail markers, right? Um, boundary markers, <coughs> uh, fences, aerial photographs, GPS, satellite systems, all locating space. Right? And as I say, you know, Einstein lived here. And you know that as he, was, he was in touch with Heisenberg. And Heisenberg's famous uncertainty principle, right? Right? You, are. you are probably here, but you might actually be there, right? I mean, and, and, and that's funny, but it's actually a true kind of statement, right? And it can be applied to prehistoric, historic, and modern issues. And let me give you a, a wonderful historic example. I love the way Paul puts up books and the, his references. So I going to do not nearly as good a job. Uh, I used to, I, one of the things I did was I studied 
There was a wonderful organization called the Hacker Organization that publishes all the captain's logs of all the ships of exploration, right? And I like to go studying them because I was interested in where disease got into the new world. I thought I'd trace the ships and see how they, the diseases happened. And recently, going back over some of that stuff, I found the following documents about ship's log. That in 1708, Bartholomew de Fonte appeared in a periodical called Memoirs for the Cur Curious. And in 1744, this story was revived. And in 17 52, he published a memoir of this. And what it said was that in 1640, a Spanish admiral sailed 5,000 miles north from Lima to 53 degrees north, where he entered the Rio de los Reyes and did all this wonderful stuff, right? This is the actual title of his map. There's a full reference. <laughs> and this is what it is. The map of the great probability of the Northwest Passage in 1755. <laughs> they thought about what is the probability? I mean, out there exploring, what is the probability? It's, not, it's spatial uncertainty. It's truly spatial uncertainty. And there you see what they're doing. A modern example the path of the Hurricane Dorian as stated on September 1st, September 3rd, and 6th, right? On the 1st, it was going all the way up to Florida. On the 3rd, it's supposed to be along the edge of Florida, and not, right? And on the 6th, it's missing it all together and going up, right? At these different times, spatial uncertainty about a major event. To put Alabama in from the president? <laughs> right, I should. Okay. So, spatial variability occurs everywhere. As Paul said, it's a universal. We are spatially dependent upon it. Therefore, I believe an estimate of uncertainty is important. It can be descriptive, it can be quantitative, it can be sensitivity, it can be based on confidence. And it, 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 it may come really from four different components. One, because we have non-spatially structured environmental variation. We have spatially structured environmental variation, which is interacting with it. And the spatial variation of the variable that we're thinking about may not be shared by the variables. And then we have unexplained things that people do that don't actually have spatial variation. So how do we handle it? Well. We try to handle it through measurement, and we try to determine the amount of sampling error. And sometimes we can do it, and sometimes we can't. And we make mistakes. And whether we are prehistoric or modern, it may be based upon the equipment we use. It may be because of the bad data in our collection methods. It may be because of the bad observers, and it may be because we mismatch the data collected by different people and or another set of different people, just trying to put the sets of information together. Let's skip that. Another very important thing, particularly prehistorically, but even today, is the semantic uncertainty of space and our spatial terms. There's a geographer named David Mark who has spent a lot of time worrying about landscape terms. <clears throat> what does it mean when I say creek, stream, river, lake, hill, mesa, mountain? <clears throat> you would think that in a language it is common. I speak English pretty much like a native. Paul speaks French as pretty much like a native. I would make a bet, in fact, I tried this experiment, that if I asked Paul and Paul asked me what that thing out there is with the kind of the trees out there, and I will say, I will say, to me, it looks like a foothill. What would you say it would be in French? Mm. 
<laughs> uh, what we'll find is it doesn't correspond. And so what Merck did, very interesting set of experiments, he had pictures and he had people in the same language say, give it the, na the same names, all kinds of different words. Right? Then he did cross language them. And, and we discovered it made it even worse. And then what you do is you try this little experiment, which he and I did as a paper. Take the word hell in English, translate it into German, translate it using an English-German dictionary, go from German to French, French to Russian, Russian back to English, and see if you come out with the same word. You don't. Mm -hmm. Right? And what, that, and what that's just demonstrating to you is that there's huge semantic uncertainty in the word. <coughs> Renfrew did the same thing about a site and a future. Zubro and Hunt did the same thing about shapes itself. What is circular, right? Is this more circular than this with a little notch out of it? Or something that's circular with a square? It turns out all kinds of different people have totally different conceptions of the shape of what is circular and other things as well. Okay, I'm probably, how am I doing on time? Uh, you see, uh, we, we have about half an hour each, okay. uh, because, uh, so you okay. still have 10 minutes. Okay. So it, one another issue, when we compare disparate data sets as archaeologists, each of which may have a very different uncertainty structure associated with it, such as location, depth, type of feature, how do we actually combine this uncertainty? How do we do it? cartographically, like bands, fuzziness of boundaries, semi-transparence, the kinds of things. And if you look at some of the standard solutions that geographers have tried to use, they don't work. For example, spatial or especially with archaeological material, Spatial autocorrelation auto causes false gradients in the data, data. Spatial correlation may show you spurious be, because of intervening cultural variables. Missing areas cause huge spatial uncertainty, both now and prehistorically. How do we you handle missing areas today. We either do it intuitively or we do it non-intuitively by extrapolation and interpolation, right? We extrapolate what we know about this location of burn to another location of burn, and we say, well, if the blocks go this way, they're going to keep on going that way. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Usually, I'll do a random choice here, the gentleman with the beard. Mm -hmm. Do you think extrapolation works better or interpolation would work better? Extrapolation is you're going from a series of points to the next point, or you have a series of points on one end and another series of points on the other end, and you're going to go guess what's in the middle. Uh, I, I guess that... Uh... I'm using both strategies. Right, actually. but which one do you think gives you better results? Well, I used one in, uh, on, the, on the Swedish uh, uh, walkabout. Right. I tried to read an unknown address mm -hmm. without having a map. Right. And so I started asking people about the direction, and nobody knew uh, the direction because they lived and went to the uh, subway. Right. And so I eventually started to ask people with dogs because they walk. Right. And so then I asked well, people with big dogs in the end because they walk further. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This is, this is perfectly, this is exactly yeah. the point I'm making. Yes, it's fantastic. Yeah. Excellent. Yes, no, continue. Well, well that, that, I, I guess that shows a kind of uh, having an idea of what, where I was just about with regard to the target and where I was at the moment with the interpolating aspect. And then on the other hand, you know, I would choose a strategy to whom I would talk to, which would be the extrapolation. Yeah. Exactly. And both work. 
Generally, we have discovered that interpolation works a little bit better than extrapolation, but it is. Um, but both of them also have the problem of creating spatial uncertainty, right? I mean, and, and we try, and these are methods to get towards it. Okay. So even if all the data and values are known without error, the combination of the variables may be uncertain. So the true form is unknown. So back to my original question, and I have to say my data I'm still analyzing, but I have here the, the basically fundamental question that I would add to Paul's paper. This is a little short part. Is popular, if you look at time, the long history of time is, we know the following, right? The number of people are increasing very rapidly and have increased over time. We know the amount of spatial information has increased over time, right? Because we know that all those people are adding up more and more spatial information. But is the amount of spatial information per person and the amount of uncertainty increasing over time? So we can imagine two different situations in which you could argue, and I'll just kind of do the extremes, that people prehistorically, if he was going out prehistorically and asking where a particular location was, People would have walked to that location. They probably would have known where they were. And so therefore, we would probably say that prehistorically, the degree of uncertainty was probably less than it is for you today. On the other hand, we might argue, and this is what I'm trying to work out with my data at the moment for Paul, is maybe it's the other way around that with all these other wonderful pieces of equipment that we have created, fences and maps and telephone GPS systems, that we actually are better at knowing where we are and what we're, where we're going than we were prehistorically. The answer to that question, I don't know, right? It could be either this or it could be that. But that's what I'm trying to get towards in this paper. And my, I'm working on the data now from various prehistoric sites and various prehistoric roads to see if I can come up with some kind of a proxy to do that. So how do we manage this uncertainty? And people have come up with various ideas, but my suggestion is simply accept it and notice that it is to a greater or lesser extent. There's a lot of literature. This is the gateway to some of it. And then I'll end with where I began, if I can, with your help. And I thought this would be pleasant for, we've all been here for a long time, this whole conference. So if we could just do this. This is some spatial uncertainty. I hope I didn't. That's fine. Thank you. Can you hear it, everybody? Yeah. Two roads diverged in the yellow wood and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear Though, as for that, the passing there had really worn them about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves 
no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet, knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Thank you.